In today's Revival podcast, we're looking at lessons learned through moves of God here in the United Kingdom. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Tim Eldridge of Presence Ministries. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to have Tim Eldridge joining me today for the Revival podcast. I met Tim uh, just over a year ago and and slowly bit by bit we've been getting to know one another and just explore what God is saying in our days and our time and I found the conversations with Tim really really helpful. Tim leads Presence Ministries married uh, to Sue and has got a wealth of history and experience in terms of what God has done and a sense of what God might be doing. So I think you're going to find this conversation rich Uh, Tim, thank you so much for being with me today and being on this program. I massively appreciate your time uh, in joining me. Well, thank you, Steve. It's an honour to be uh, joining with you today. And uh, like you say, it's only a year since we first met, but it feels longer. Yeah. Um, yeah, There's like a joining of the Holy Spirit taking place. Yeah, and I found all all of our conversations, each time we've interacted in person or online, uh, massively helpful in just discerning some of what we as a church have been through and what we're looking forward to. Well, our theme for the podcast is all about revival, uh, each of the sessions, but taken from slightly different perspectives. So my very first question to you, what would revival mean to you? Well, that's a really good question because revival, the word means different things to different people. Uh, Some parts of the world, like North America, when you use the word revival, they think of meetings and uh, they, they would commonly say we're having a series of revival meetings. But I think that kind of robs uh, the full meaning of the word, which is, is really revive me. It starts in us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I, I would start with each one of us that the Holy Spirit needs to revive us. Uh, to bring us alive again, a bit like a defibrillator. And if we're not dead or dying, then we all need revival as well because uh, uh, sovereign things happen in a move of God that don't happen uh, when we're just being faithful and and going through uh, the motions of what we do. So revival to me is is a season or a time uh, that the Holy Spirit shows up and begins to work, not just in the church, but in, in the wider society around. And so we can study past revivals. Each one looks slightly different. But to me, it starts in the hearts of people. And uh, they, they, they will get hungry, hungry for more of God. I think of times in my life where I just got desperate for more of him. And uh, uh, acute prayer, times of prayer and presence where you just um, you're just hungry for more of God and you you want Him to break in. It, it reminds me of a couple of quotes actually. One is uh, in um, uh, the story of the Hebrides. Duncan Campbell's definition of revival is a people saturated with God, which is Absolutely. yeah, it's what you're saying. There's a there's a renewed thirst, a renewed hunger. Spiritual matters uh, feel closer and like we need to do something about them. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm, I'm also, you know, the way that you, you talked about across the pond, uh, the, the word revival can just mean a series of meetings, three or four, five days or a week long. You know, we're going to have a revival, but it's scheduled. It's no, we know the dates and the times. And, and that's not what we mean. And I, I found what you're talking about, the wider kind of touching on society. When, when I uh, have spoken to George Otis, uh, he, he kind of coins the phrase transforming revival. Uh, In other words, it it does something in us, transforms us, but it actually leads uh, to societal uh, transformation, sometimes economic transformation, sometimes the land is transformed. I I know that concept might be difficult for some people to grasp if they haven't read stories about what God has done in history or even what he is doing in some parts of the earth today. So appreciate that definition. I A couple of weeks ago, we spoke and uh, we were talking about some of what you've been involved in. Um, I may, they, 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 some would call them revivals, some might call them renewals, some might say they're a move of the spirit. Yeah. Uh, I think there's echoes of transformation that have taken place through those moves. Clearly, it was way beyond just humans 
uh, initiating some program or activity. Um, yeah. But you, you've had the privilege of being involved in a few of those, even though you're not old. It just feels like you were born at the right time, in the right place. Would you share what some of those movements you've been involved in uh, have been? And then the second part of that question might be what lessons you learned in observing that. And often we learn the lessons afterwards, don't we, once yeah. we come out the other end? Yeah, um, I mean, I was born um, uh, in the late 60s and uh, or early 60s, I should say. And in the late 60s, my mum and dad um, uh, really came back to the Lord. They'd been believers uh, earlier, but they really started pursuing God. And they, we were in a Baptist church, so I was kind of brought up in that. And then um, there was a couple from the States came, uh, Dennis and Rita Bennett wrote a book called Nine O'Clock in the Morning. Uh, and my mum and dad really wanted the Holy Spirit uh, as an experience. And so they were prayed for, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized. And um, uh, the church that they were in really split down the middle. Half wanted that and half didn't. And so my mum and dad began to meet in their home. Uh, and so that was the kind of the environment that I can remember as I grew up in. Uh, a, a real move of the Holy Spirit. People would come from a long way just to experience um, something that, that it's hard to imagine now wasn't there. Um, and uh, different speakers, itinerant speakers would come and help them build that. And so that's that's really the environment I grew up in. So it was a sovereign move of God. And uh, later that kind of morphed into what uh, uh, became known as the house church movement and kind of a disparate group of uh, different house churches, um, but very, very Holy Spirit led and uh, and then later, that just day, if you don't mind, just mention some of the key names, not just in the movement you were in, but around in that era. I know Arthur Wallace was significant. Yes. Terry Virgo was involved in some of that. It's just giving people some kind of context. Sure, sure. So Arthur Wallace would be like the father um, and, and he used to come and stay in our house regularly, prayed for me when I was six. And he he would he basically grew um, uh drew a group of people, uh, prophetic and teachers, and what later became known as apostles, although that word wasn't used then. And he drew them together and they looked at the at scriptures, um, they looked at eschatology, and they were from very different backgrounds. So people like uh, Gerald Coates, people like John Noble, people like uh, Bryn Jones, um, uh, Terry Verga, you mentioned, he came on a, a little bit later. Um, some of the other ones that are no longer around, like Dave Mansell. And so we grew up in this environment with these different people. There was another one called uh, Graham Perrins, who was from Cardiff. And these, these guys were studying the scriptures together and, uh, and really came and, and bought some teaching and some, uh, uh, structure to this disparate group of what was known as house churches. And then later on, they morphed into different streams um, like uh, uh, New Frontiers or uh, uh, CNET or Cornerstone or, or um, Pioneer. Um, yeah, Pioneer would be another one. So there was, there was probably about 20 brothers, seven originally, and then it kind of kept growing as more and more people were hungry for, for things of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of those teachers were out of traditional backgrounds, uh, brethren, Baptist. Uh, a few Pentecostal, but they were they they were men of teaching. So they they would they would study the scriptures with fresh eyes to see what the Holy Spirit was doing, and so that was a real move uh, of the Holy Spirit, um, uh, which really touched all the people. I, I, I should just say before that, sort of in the fifties, um, Billy Graham had come and he'd done a big uh, crusade in Harringay, London, and so that stirred up. It was people a lot of people saved but it actually stirred up the church as well and they were looking for a new expression uh, not just the the state i mean it's hard to believe now but you know the baptist church that we were in there was no instruments like a piano or or guitar or drums it was just you know an organ and uh, a one person that's that's what worship was like so this was so radical because people were like just hungry for the holy spirit and they would play a guitar in their home and people would just turn up and pray and, and seek God. So that was kind of my earliest memories. Yeah. So that, that's the first kind of movement. And I, I'm, I'm correct in thinking that you were closer out of all of those, closer to some of the Bryn Jones stuff and the ministry that 
Not, not originally. Originally, I was in the south of England, and so it was more the, the kind of southern brothers. We, we did know Bryn, but we didn't have as much to do with him. Yeah. Um, but then later, um, we moved, uh, or I moved to the north, and so I served Bryn and his team or his stream and uh, got to know him well. He was, he was actually in the States, but his team was based in Bradford, and so I worked with them quite closely and became part of uh, a number of their churches in the West Yorkshire area. And uh, so I got to see that. And that was kind of later. That was almost 10 years after the, the first initial move. And I've heard tremendous stories on the, the sense of the breath of God in terms of God blowing on meetings. There was miracles. Uh, prophecy was very alive. It was new, but there was so much of it going on, discerning God's will. There was camp meetings, kind of star meetings starting that were exploding in number that was unheard of. Uh, nowadays, yeah. with all our festivals, it's like, oh, yeah, we do that. I guess back then it was so brand new. It, it was new. And uh, I, I can remember the Dale's Bible Weeks, particularly in the 1970s. And I, I actually live in Harrogate now. And, uh, and, and that, that venue is still there. But I can remember coming and and the Holy Spirit would just kind of come in waves and, and it was spontaneous. You know, you'd have 8,000 people in what was the flower hall on this showground and the spontaneity of, of worship would start at one end and it would go like a wave to the other end. And then, of course, in 1977, there was a lot of documented cases of angelic activity, not just from the people on the showground, but actually from people that lived on the perimeter of the showground that were phoning the police, writing to the newspaper saying these people are singing at two, three o'clock in the morning. And my father-in-law was actually administrating those Bible weeks and uh, the police turned up one night at two o'clock in the morning and said, we've had complaints of noise. And he said, but everybody's asleep. No, no one's awake. And they insisted on going into this flower hall. And when they opened the doors and went in, it was like 10,000 people singing at the top of their voice. And they said, you need to turn that off. And they said, there's nothing on. There's no PA connected. And it was just angelic activity singing over that ground. And then a number of people in neighboring properties said they saw angels. They called them aliens in their gardens. And then, and then so many testimonies on the site of children saying an angel uh, took me by the hand. I'd lost my way back to my tent and my caravan and they, they took me and I found my way back. And just, uh, I think it was like 30 different incidents um, over, over a one week period. And they were very life shaping times that the people that came and spoke, they were, they were building something in the nation from these, these disparate groups that were coming together, wanting to know more of, of what the Holy Spirit was doing. That's, it's phenomenal. I haven't heard those stories before. So it's like, wow, Lord, do it again in our day. Um, the, the third movement that you were involved in then? Well, then after that, um, uh, uh, th those different streams went different ways. And we worked with uh, one of those streams, which was still in Bradford. And that was um, what was called Abundant Life when we were there, Abundant Life Church, now called Life Church, under under uh, Paul Scanlon. And he was one stream, really. It had come out of the Covenant Ministries uh, stable. And he really felt like he, he didn't want to. He, it was like a new chapter to him. And I'd served Bryn and I'd served Paul. And so we stayed on in Bradford. That was our relationship. And, uh, and then that became very big, very quickly. And it was at the time that we were transitioning ourselves to Harrogate to, to take over an existing church and, and actually uh, to, to lead that. But that, that movement went quite big, very quickly, had a lot of influence. Paul was a very kind of practical uh, preacher, so he would see things and he would speak into things that he felt burdened by. And so I was kind of in that for a while. And then our journey then took us on to, to other waves. I mean, the, the, there was the, the moves of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I would call them times of refreshing rather than revival. They were refreshing the church. So you have the kind of 94 to 97 um, refreshing, uh, sometimes called Toronto blessing. I don't personally like that term, but there was a move of the Holy Spirit where again, people felt dry and, uh, and just that these waves would come through the church. And some of it was laughter. Some of it was, uh, kabod heavy, 
um, glory of God coming upon you where you just couldn't get out of your chair. And, and I wasn't really fixated on the manifestations, although I experienced many of them. My wife didn't experience any. She's very passionate and very emotional in real life. I'm probably very cerebral. And it was just interesting to watch when that move came, how it affected me and how it affected her. But we learned it wasn't really uh, what manifestation you experienced or not. It was really a power source in pressing into the Holy Spirit. And, and when we didn't focus on the manifestations, but we, we focused on the Holy Spirit, however he chose or chose to touch us was, was absolutely appropriate. And I can remember lying on the floor, falling over many times, but lying on the floor saying, what's this about? And it felt like one, one encounter felt like it was open heart surgery on me. And I, I literally laid there for two hours in the church building. And it was literally like the Holy Spirit was doing open heart surgery. And at the end of that, I got up and I was changed, but I still had to walk in the good of that and make good choices to live in the light of that. And some people just got off the carpet and just said, that was a great experience yeah. and never did anything with it. And others said, okay, I'm going to make a choice here um, to pursue this. Wow. So that was, that was very, very good. And that one, I mean, all of those that you mentioned so far, I've not been involved in, I've read about them. That one in 94, 95, I, I don't know how, but it just totally bypassed me. So I, I, I think after it, I was aware something had happened in 94, 95, but just the circles I was in and stuff, it, we just never kind of, it, it, it was like crossing paths in the night, really. Um, I mean, uh, probably probably a year or two before that, there was somebody called Rodney Howe Brown, still around from Florida now, but South African. And he came to Wembley in London and, I, and myself and a friend went to that. And there was sort of 8,000 people in this arena. And that was the first time I'd really seen that stuff. Now, later on, it became known as Toronto, but actually it was breaking out in different places. Paul Scanlon didn't know any of this and had gone to Africa and while he was preaching, people just began to laugh and fall over and he, he didn't understand what was going on. So I don't think it was linked to one group or one person, um, but there was, you could certainly receive an impartation of it. But I think all over um, the world, the Holy Spirit was just breathing and, and it was just breaking out in different places. You are so, uh, unique. So you've been through all of those and that's more than most people, but there's still... Uh, more so I'm going to let you let you share a little bit more then I do want to move on to lessons learned and sure. yeah that would be helpful for our listeners as well I, I mean there was a couple of other I'll be really quick um, in 90 at the end of uh, um, 19 um, sorry 2004 I was leading the church and I was really desperate for more of the Holy Spirit and I just thought if this is leading the church I've been do leading in Harrogate for seven years by that time and I just thought I need more of the Holy Spirit I, I just I, I can't do this otherwise and I went to Canada because I'd heard of somebody and I went there and I listened and I, I was actually really offended um, by most of what I heard uh, I, I could see the Holy Spirit was moving but it was just so out of my my framework uh, and and so different to what I'd experienced that day that I just thought, what is this? And I can remember sitting on the plane coming home, just in that kind of state where, where I'm falling asleep. And I was just questioning everything that had gone on. And I had this encounter, that's the only way I can describe it. And it was like I, I was finishing a jigsaw puzzle and putting the last piece in. And in, in my kind of orphanness, I was handing it to God and saying, there we are, that's what we built for you. And on paper, everything looked amazing in our church. You know, we were growing. We were the largest we'd ever been. We had ministries on every side. Uh, and yet there was a dissatisfaction inside of me, which had taken me to Canada. And on the way home, this encounter happened and the Holy Spirit took this picture, this puzzle. And I remember him in a loving way, just went like this <laughs> with all the pieces. And they went up in the air and they came back and they settled and a completely different picture had formed. Mm -hmm. And he handed it back to me and he said, now it's time to do it my way. And I was horrified because I thought, well, what have I been doing for seven years? But I was trying to make things happen. I was trying to copy what other places had had their breakthrough in a, in a right motive, but just uh, not, not really um, cutting through. And after that moment, 
I came home and everything literally changed in our church. And the next seven years was completely different and far more fruitful. And it was a, it was a deep pursuit of the Holy Spirit. And, and in that time, that led us to connect with Bill Johnson and others in, in what's known as Redding, California, a small place. You, you know, it was like hilly billy land. You would not go there. Uh, there's nothing else there in, in Redding. And yet the, the Holy Spirit had been moving on them. And, uh, and just this hunger drew me there. And the first time I went was 2007. And the moment I walked in, I thought, I'm home. Not home because I would do things the same way as them, but home because there was this revival going on and people were getting touched and, and healing was breaking out. And, and I wanted to see more of that. And so that was a, an exciting time. And we, we've had relationship with them over the last 15 years, learned some really great things that have really helped us on our journey. Mm. Fantastic. That's really, really helpful. Really rich. I mean, I would love to drill into lots of those and maybe privately we will. Um, but just and, and obviously we want to be sensitive to people and I know you are and stories. Um, but in all of those, as in all of life, uh, we learn lessons. We, we normally in hindsight, which it'd be great to have foresight, not just hindsight, but as you reflect back on all of those moves, what would be some of the key lessons that you've kind of picked up on and learned that you think would be helpful for us in the, and we will look at what we sense is coming, but in the season we're in right now, as you look back. Um, I mean, first of all, I just want to say I'm tremendously grateful for all of those moves of God. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't had the impact and the, the fathering from many different leaders uh, through my life. So I, I don't want in any way to, to sound critical or judgmental. That's not my heart. Absolutely. And I, I know you really well. And I'm, I'm of the same kind of thing. I'm thankful for all of that, not critical. But I think if we can learn anything, what Absolutely. would it be that we can learn? I think uh, I think the first thing uh, is to keep the main thing the main thing, and and everybody says that uh, at the beginning, uh, like the Holy Spirit, we're we're presence led, or we're not we're not, not about performance, or it's not about how successful we look, but it's actually focused on on Holy Spirit and doing you know pleasing the Father. But what happens in any move is there's huge demands that come upon a movement or a church or, or a group of churches, whatever it is. And, um, and, and the demands are, are good. You know, they're, they're not bad opportunities. They're all really good. And people just get busy, um, really busy. You know, if, if you have 2000 uh, emails a day, um, you know, that's busy. And if you miss a day, you've got 4000. And so I think. Um, that that's one thing to really guard against uh, the busyness that comes in. That it's like it wars against the Holy Spirit, and sometimes you just have to be really radical and say, you know, I'm not going to be admin led. I'm going to be Holy Spirit led, and if that means I don't answer emails, then find somebody else or, or recruit some people to to take care of that admin. Um, I think the second thing is relationships can really be strained in a move of God. Um, and I look back uh, and it's sad to me that over and over again, um, the church repeats the same mistakes. And so if I can go back even further than my personal experience, if you go back to the um, Welsh revival, for example, the sad thing when I studied that some years ago is that there were more church splits and divisions after the Welsh revival than there were before. And I think there's something wrong here because, you know, a conservative estimate, there was 200,000 people came to Christ in that amazing move of God. But afterwards, the church were fractured, arguing, splitting and, uh, and the same after Azusa Street. And so I don't want to make the same mistake again. I want to I want to be strong. And so I think he's really speaking about relationships and and looking back over these different moves of God where people fell out with each other or they strongly disagreed. And to me, disagreement isn't isn't the issue of parting. Um, we can strongly disagree, but still choose to walk in love with one another. And and if 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 love is my main goal, then I can disagree with you, or you can disagree with me. But we're not going to separate. You know, that's denominational thinking. It's like I have to agree all this doctrine, and the moment I change, I'm out. And I think there's there there has to be flexibility in our relationships to to bear with one another i think it's um, just i'll just jump in for a second there 
I mean, I'm agreeing with you 100%. And some of our conversations with our All Nations movement team is along those lines. How do we handle platform? How do we handle theological differences? Uh, How do we deal with the Lord touches one person and they're promoted in a way? And uh, I think, you know, I I remember looking at the Azusa revival about a year ago in detail with a new book that had come out then. And and some of the things I didn't know, the arguments between some of the staff, how somebody stole the database and moved to Portland. And uh, it just like took the wind out of uh, William Seymour. Uh, He went up and pleaded for it back because it was his source of funding. And and I think it comes to maybe there's a slight theological difference, uh, but then there might be a financial challenge. So if we're not consecrated before the Lord, and I think in this season, uh, actually having some of those conversations um, under the pressure as the glory of God comes and uh, platforms get bigger, um, yeah. crowds get bigger, uh, finances start to flow a bit more, books are sold, whatever it might be. Social media presence might get bigger, which is a brand new phenomenon for moves of God and what might happen. If we're not, if we're not living in the light of eternity and we're not becoming more like Jesus, it's easy for those issues to start uh, causing those relationships. So I guess I'm agreeing with you and just saying they're normally very practical things that cause the divisions. Yeah, and, and relationships, you know, can expose things that are in our heart, which we don't know. It's like under pressure they come out. So things like jealousy or favour from, from God on, on one person or one group of people can, can really elevate them. Uh, and, you know, instead of celebrating that, um, we can think, well, you know, that's affecting me or, or it's affecting my finances in my, my sphere, uh, instead of celebrating what God's doing somewhere else. And, and so all those kind of things can come to the surface. And if we haven't dealt with them ahead of time, then we're, we're going to act like orphans. And, and, and I mean, rather than sons, or orphan behavior, like in the prodigal son. We can either be like the older brother. This isn't fair. These people have only been saved two minutes and look what God's doing with them. And we can be like the older brother in church. You know, I've been around 40 years and this hasn't happened to me instead of celebrating what's taking place. So I think relationships are are not an add on. They're absolutely key. Uh, And, uh, uh, you know, in, in John 21, uh, Jesus says, throw the nets on the other side of their boat, uh, which was kind of inconvenient for them to do because of the rigging on the, on the starboard side. And they, they, they caught a great catch. Um, but a, a similar story to that in Luke 5, at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, you know, the, the, it says they went fishing and their nets were torn. You don't go fishing with, with torn nets. And so the nets, to me, speak of relationship. And, you know, I think it's God's grace that he hasn't poured out a revival on us because he's waiting for us to get our act together on relationships. Because when you look at the, the past revivals here, like the Welsh revival or the Outer Hebrides revival, all that division didn't go away. It just got heightened in the intensity of what God was doing. And so I think it's his grace. He's saying, look, you've got time to build strong relationships with other people so that when we go fishing for this wonderful harvest, we haven't got a big hole in the bottom of our net. Very, very good. It's interesting. Um, I think it was probably eight years ago. I, I kind of, in a, in a season of prayer, it might have been nine or 10, I can't, at times sometimes. Anyway, we were in a season of prayer And we actually felt the Lord saying to us, uh, prepare, because the greatest revival leading to the greatest harvest you've ever seen is about to come. And I I kind of faithfully that just um, on the Sunday declared it to the church. The Lord actually said it in a number of ways over about three or four weeks. And I kept saying it to people, uh, but I never did anything about it. And then finally, it was like the Lord said to me, I keep telling you, prepare, and you just keep declaring revival's coming and harvest is coming. And it was a real stern rebuke, like, oh, I'm hearing the first part of what you're saying, but I'm doing nothing with the second part. And it actually led to us really considering what are we doing? How do we prepare? How do we get ready? And and even over the years now, I think probably more significantly over the last 18 months, two years, understanding what preparation might look like. And I think some of it is is relational. Some of it is theology. Some of it is very practical. 
like the models of church or church planting, what that looks like, what mission looks like, so we don't become parochial. So there's some of the things that we're wrestling with. Let me ask you, Tim, what, what's your sense of what God's uh, doing at the moment in the season that we're in? Uh, and, and maybe link to that your hope for the future as well. So the sense now and where is it taking us? Just just to commend you, Steve, because I think you've really you, you are pioneering something new, but you've you've heard the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to say that because I do believe that you and your sphere of influence really is preparing with new wineskins for what the Holy Spirit wants to do. You know, the old isn't going to work in the new. Um, we're, we're novices in the new, experts in the old, but the experts uh, in the old isn't going to be viable anymore. So, so well done. Thank you. Um, I think, I think um, lots of things, uh, I think we're in a time of huge disruption and uncertainty. And you could argue, well, we're always in a time of uncertainty in one way or another. But I mean, just the, the um, one small part of that, but it feels huge, is this, is this um, COVID pandemic that we've been living through. It's changing everything. It's changing the way we travel. It's changing the way we do things. You know, there's the whole technology uh, element that we've all had to grapple with in the last year. Uh, whereas perhaps we used to physically go places. And I'm sure there'll be a mixture of both as we go forward, but there's, there's this huge disruption. And I, I believe it's in the context of something bigger that God's doing. He's disrupting the old and uh, it, some's not going to survive and, and, and others is being birthed in this time or new wineskins are being developed. So I, I think I think it's not a time to be fearful. It's a time of uncertainty. Um, but it's a time to really um, anchor into Christ himself, uh, to be uh, Christ focused, not focused on our, our structures or things that we've been used to in the past or even relationships that maybe we had in the last season. It's a time to really anchor into him himself. And it's, it's a little bit like a hurricane going on all around us. Uh, but in the eye of the storm, it's, it's calm. And so I think if we can live in rest and peace, in the midst of lots of things that are changing that we don't understand, it's all a mystery around, then I think we, we will do well. well, we'll navigate through that. And of course, the pandemic is just one of many things. You know, some of the prophets are saying there's going to be a decade of disruption. Uncertainty. Yeah, I, I actually believe that. I don't know about a decade. Um, I found myself saying it last year. Sometimes I say things and then afterwards realize, I think that was the Lord speaking. So, I'm, uh, But I actually felt like this is a birth pain. Uh, yeah. like Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, and it's only the beginnings. I know when Esther, we, we've got four kids, so um, the birth pains actually got more frequent and more intense as they carried on. And I, yeah, so I don't want to get distracted by having that conversation, but I do agree that there's there's greater intensity birth pains coming, and they're yeah. going to come closer together Yes. And, and so the church really does need to be responsive to what the spirit is saying. Yeah. And there's a huge opportunity in there because people, that you know, um, in the last season that weren't saved, uh, quite happy in life, you know, maybe successful, maybe wealthy, whatever, uh, have, have had everything stripped away in the last year. And, and other things might come, you know, we might have an economic crisis now. Uh, I don't want to prophesy that, but, you know, it's quite possible. Yep. And so I think people's trust has been misplaced in many, you know, many um, examples. And so the only, the only place that we can trust is in Christ. And so I think in the midst of all this, the church has a huge opportunity. Uh, I mean, it's the church over the last year that practically have helped feed people, but I, I'm talking more than just the practicals mm -hmm. of food banks and debt relief. I, I'm talking about um, the gospel itself and, and communicating that. And, and every era, we have to learn a way, new way of communicating that gospel. The message doesn't change, but the packaging in how we do it does change. Yeah. And we can't do the Sunday night gospel service like we did back in the 50s because people won't come. So we have to find different ways of communicating. And people are actually hungry um, to, to know the good news when you share it with them. And so I think I think we're coming into a, a, a huge, uh, wonderful season for the church. 
But at the same time, many of the things that we've identified in the past as our church or the way we do things is is being disrupted and changed. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100 percent on that. I think we're going to have the most glorious days and the most challenging days. Yes. Isaiah 60, darkness and light both yep. coexisting. Yep. Uh, and really, the light is supposed to shine even brighter in the darkness. And, it, yep. and it's normally in disruptive moments that movements have gone, revivals take place. It, yep. It's when people can't put their trust anywhere else that they look and uh, become more aware of eternity and look up towards the Lord. So I'm in agreement. Uh, as we draw this to a close, um, I'm going to ask you in a moment uh, uh, kind of keys to embracing the moving over into the new that God has for us. Uh, but before I ask that, is there uh, how if people wanted to connect with Tim Eldridge, how best can they do that? Well, we have uh, a number of websites. We have one Presence Ministries, which is our ministry site. I also have one myself and Sue has one herself as well. So you can connect through those. There's emails available through there. We don't like to really promote ourselves because we're just we're at the age now we've done all sorts of things, but we're at the age now where we're really a mum and dad to many different ministries. And we're very, very happy with that. We're not seeking anything, but we just, we really want to champion younger generations because, you know, my, my season's not over. I'm going to keep running until I drop, but I, I really believe that God is releasing new ministries and, and people that have been in the secret place in the last era are going to come center stage in the new era. So our, our, heart and goal is obviously for the presence of God. We don't want to go anywhere unless it's his presence, but we really want to champion younger people. Amen. Amen. That's great. Uh, keys to crossing over into the new, embracing what God is doing. Yeah, I think uh, walk closely with the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, some things won't make sense. It's like, um, it's like if you read in Acts with Peter, you know, it was, uh, he was told to, to go and meet with Cornelius and, and, and food that didn't fit his Jewish culture. And I think there will be some things that are really going to challenge us theologically, things that we thought I've got, we've got it all sorted out and this is my theological box and I, I know it. I think we're going to, we're going to find ourselves in some situations like that. And you need, you need great discernment because it's not just the latest fad that somebody else might be doing. But it's really discerning what the Holy Spirit's doing. But it will challenge us. And, and it's not that I don't see, uh, it's not that I reject what I've seen before, but it's like I come into a higher reality of yeah. what I've known before. So I, you know, for 40 years, I believed in apostles and prophets, but my perspective and understanding of that has changed. What I thought it meant 40 years ago and what I believe it means now is, is changed. The scripture hasn't changed, but my understanding of that has grown and revelations developed. Yeah, very, very good. I, th I think the safest place to live, I'm just affirming what you said, is to walk closely with the Lord. Um, yeah. You know, Jesus' words, I am the way or the road. Uh, yeah. I am the truth. I am the light. Uh, so if we want light, we want to stay on the road um, and we want to walk in truth. It's, it's walking with him. And I, I, I guess it's one of our challenges because life does get busy. Yes. We can start getting into a competitiveness in, even in ministry of what somebody else is doing, what we should be doing, how we should be doing. And it becomes a machine that will chew you up and spit you out the other end. Yes. And so somehow embracing lives that will live in the place where those moments with the Lord, uh, moments of stillness, journaling, being in his presence, being in his word, not sacrificing them because of opportunity or even busyness, Yes. And so I, I would say that you've, for me, I have sensed the Lord, even in the last week where I felt like some of it, I've got it wrong. Uh, we've just been really full on. And Esther and I this morning were praying and, and she just, it was like a little word from the Lord, but it wasn't a big prophetic word. But she just said to me, she goes, you, you really will need to guard moments of stillness and quiet in amongst the busyness that's developing around you. And, yes. uh, and yeah, we, we spent time praying into it this morning. I actually felt for me, having somebody who becomes like the guardian of my diary. Uh, I've had PAs for years, but actually saying, I'm, I'm giving you permission and asking you to like be a gatekeeper over certain times in my day and in my week. So that helps me in the way that I live. Accountable to my wife, accountable to that person and accountable before the Lord.
It's so good. It's so good. You know, the vine, the vine rather, and the inner vineyard, you know, it, the vine has a tendency to grow uh, left and right, and, and it can grow forever, but but the, the, the sweetness of the grapes will start to change uh, if it's overstretched. And so that the vine key comes and he trims the vines, not because it's bad, but because he wants those grapes to remain potent and, and what they're supposed to be. And so the overstretching speaks of us getting busy. So just, just pulling it back. Um, it means that what we do, we might do less, but actually we'll have more effect. Yeah. It's brilliant, Tim. Thank you. Uh, I do hope everybody's enjoyed this. Tim, thank you so much for joining me today. I do believe it's been a rich, rich session with lots of wisdom. Um, I want to thank everybody that's been a part of the show today and praying that you'll know God's richness as you outwork the practical steps from today's program. Thanks again, Tim. Thank you. Right now, I have a special deal on my four books. Rouse the Warriors, which is all about raising an end-time army. Burning Ones, which is about igniting a fuel and a passion for Jesus. One Life, all about discovering your purpose and what God has called you to do. And then the devotional, highly flammable, 40 days of devotions to set your heart on fire. There's a deal right now on all four books, and you can find out more at steveuppel.com.